2,000 years ago, the Egyptians invented something astonishing, the pyramid. For 100 years, the Egyptians continued to build more pyramids, always very close to the first one. Every one of these was a huge construction requiring thousands of workers and millions of tons of raw material. And then suddenly, for no apparent reason, they moved the whole operation north to a brand new site. But the pharaohs were not simply content to change site once. Despite huge logistical problems, they kept changing location in the Nile Valley. Something very powerful was driving them to ceaselessly choose new places to build pyramids. But what was it? To investigate this mystery, Egyptologist Dominic Montserrat and archaeologist Miriam Cook go on the trail of the wandering pyramids. Trace hundreds of years of pyramid building, the Egypt detectives have taken to their mobile headquarters, letting the river take the strain of carrying them between the sites. For the pharaohs building those monuments, however, things were not so simple. Each time a new location was chosen, a whole city of laborers, stonemasons, architects, and surveyors had to be moved, resettled, and supplied. The whole extraordinary project had begun, logically enough, close to the ancient capital, Memphis, from where building work could easily be overseen. But then, quite suddenly, that site was abandoned in favor of a new location at Giza. But even here, the pharaohs were not content, and they moved again, and again, and yet again, eventually ending up close to where the whole project had started, at Saqqara. For years, experts have argued over whether it was purely practical considerations or some deeper religious reason that drove the moves. Why isn't there just one great pyramid field where each pharaoh could rest surrounded by his predecessors? Archaeologists have not yet reached a consensus, and the Egypt detectives are no exception. This is the situation we have. This is the pyramids at Saqqara, mm. there's the Nile, and then the move up to Giza. Mm. Well, we need to explain why. Well, these are religious monuments. The Egyptians are incredibly particular about their sacred spaces. So I wonder if there isn't some religious aspect of the Giza Plateau that influences the relocation. Dominic's years of research suggest to him a religious explanation, but Miriam is after archeological evidence. Was it significant that the first pyramid built at the new northerly location was the massive Great Pyramid? Building the Great Pyramid was the most challenging engineering feat that they'd ever attempted. The puzzle must have something to do with that. The move north must have solved engineering or structural problems. Well, what problems? Well, that's what we need to find out. To discover what practical considerations drove pharaohs to choose a pyramid site, Miriam has decided to look more closely at the construction and location of the earliest pyramid of all, built around 2650 BC at Saqqara. This was the first in what would soon become an essential part of the pharaoh's burial rite. Egyptians believed that the pharaoh was resurrected as Osiris, king of the dead. So to ensure his smooth transition into the afterlife, Great care was taken not only with mummifying his body, but also with providing him with a suitable tomb from which he could ascend to heaven. This was the origin of the pyramids. The Egyptians were great pragmatists. Take this first pyramid right behind me here at Saqqara. It's called the Step Pyramid, and it looks very different to the other pyramids. Its sides are stepped, not smooth. And it's these very steps that tell a story. Before this pyramid was built, the elite of ancient Egypt 
were buried in flat roof tombs called mastabas. Look at this first step. It's obviously the first thing to be built. And the incredible thing is they could have stopped right here. Without going any further, they'd already created a low-lying flat roof tomb called a mastaba. Until the step pyramid, the kings had been very happy to be buried within these mastabas. So the builders could have packed up their tools and gone home. But they didn't. They had an inspiration. Why not build big and place more mastabas on top of the first? And that's just what they did. And then they built another, and then another, and then another. And the result was the very first pyramid. I think the evolution of all the pyramids was the result of these practical what-if experiments. The ancient Egyptians became increasingly ambitious, testing the limits of their skills and their raw materials. But Dominic isn't easily convinced by the practical argument. He's searching for a deeper spiritual answer among Egypt's ancient religious records. Miriam, meanwhile, went in search of a concrete example to prove her point. Could she unearth practical reasons why the pharaoh Khufu had first decided to move away from Saqqara and build far to the north at Giza? To find out, she has arranged to meet a leading Egyptian geologist, Dr. Bache Asawi, to discover more about the ancient Egyptians' most essential raw material. And limestone was used in building all of the pyramids. What makes it such a perfect building material? It's a very durable uh, kind of rock. And uh, secondly, Egypt is very rich in limestone. And third, is that it has uh, layering and jointing, which help quarrying the types of limestone. So the layers actually dictate the size of the blocks? Yes, certainly. And you can see, you can see the layers. This is the size. This is the maximum size. The rocks can be cut from these layers. So the pharaoh Khufu's grand plans could have been limited by the size and availability of the limestone blocks at Saqqara. So when they wanted to build a bigger pyramid, they were actually limited by the raw material here. Yeah, and uh, not only this, but also because of the space also. You don't have quite a good space here to build bigger pyramids. And so they had to go to a different place. Oh, yeah, indeed they did. <laughs> After almost 100 years of pyramid building at Saqqara, the new pharaoh Khufu found the site could not cope with his ambition to build the greatest pyramid of all time. So he moved his entire operation north to Giza. Well, we're here at Giza. What made this a better place to build? If you look at the stones behind you, you find that you have several layers of rocks. And this, this limestone is a lot more easy to get out Yes, then. the joints on both sides and then the bedding planes, then you can easily pull the rock from, the, from its original place. So it is unfinished blocks? Yeah, that's why, that's how they, uh, they do it, you see, by chiseling the, uh, along the joints by harder rocks. And that's how they cut this uh, into big pieces, of course, depending on the joints and on the bedding planes. And that's why they came here, because uh, uh, it's bigger blocks than any other place in, uh, in the area. Dr. Desawi's theory suggests that it was the availability of larger stone blocks and a greater expanse of flat ground on which to build that persuaded Khufu to abandon the burial site of his ancestors and move to Giza. Practical reasons from a practical pharaoh. Giza was the perfect place. Plenty of limestone blocks to work with and a solid base upon which to begin building one of the wonders of the world, the Great Pyramid. How do you account for the next pyramid? They didn't build that here at Giza, but miles away over there at Abu Ruash. I don't see the problem with that. There was plenty of good limestone up there as well. Well, bear with me. We'll go on up to Abu Ruash and I'll show you a more powerful reason than geology for building pyramids up here in the north. Simple geology might explain why building moved from Saqqara to Giza. But what Miriam can't explain is why the next pharaoh then abandoned this apparently perfect site and moved again. Perhaps it's time to see if Dominic really can discover more compelling answers deep in Egypt's ancient religion.
Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. The Egypt detectives are trying to discover why pharaohs built the pyramids where they did. But competing theories mean tensions are rising. Miriam Cook, an archaeologist, is drawn towards a practical, geological solution, while Egyptologist Dominic Montserrat believes the location of the pyramids is the key to a greater mystery, whose solution lies in the religious beliefs of the pharaohs themselves. So why, after the Great Pyramid was built at Giza, did the next pharaoh, Jedifre, move the building operation yet again to Abu Ruash? Well, you've brought me here to Abu Ruash, and I'm standing on the pyramid, but it doesn't look very finished to me. That's right, it probably never was finished. It's always seemed like an odd thing to do, to come all the way up here to build if there's all that marvellous building stone on the Giza Plateau. I just don't find the geological argument accounts for everything. Well, how would you explain it then, Dominic? Well, if we'd been standing up here four and a half thousand years ago, we'd have been able to see Heliopolis, and I think that's a really important clue. And why is that? Well, if you buy me a cup of coffee, I might just tell you. OK, you're on. Heliopolis, the centre of sun worship in ancient Egypt and the city at the heart of the pharaoh's beliefs. A city now lost in suburban sprawl. But what has this to do with pyramids? Well, I've got your coffee here, but first I want you to explain why you think Heliopolis is so important for the move to Abu Rawash and Giza. If you look at the names of the pharaohs who built at Giza and Abu Ruash, you see something really interesting. Because first of all, you've got Jedefre at uh, Abu Ruash, and then Kaefre, Kefren. And Menkare, who built the third pyramid at Giza. Kare, exactly. And what have these three pharaohs all got in common? Re in their names. The sun god Re was clearly central to the beliefs of these pharaohs, so much so that they even adopted his name. For them, he was the god who sailed across the sky in his solar boat by day and across the underworld of the dead by night. When they died, these kings also believed they would join him on this journey, a journey that would begin when their bodies were laid to rest in their immortal monument, their pyramid. Well, Heliopolis was the city of the sun, wasn't it? They must have been worshippers of his cult because they all chose names which honoured him. Well, you can have your coffee now. Oh, thank you. But we still know so little about Heliopolis. Well, that's right. It's just a suburb of modern Cairo now. Might be worth checking out. The site of Heliopolis today has been overwhelmed by the suburbs of Cairo. But do any clues survive to link these sun pharaohs with their sun city? And can these provide a solution more compelling than Miriam's? Miriam has arranged to meet Dr. David Jeffries, a veteran archaeologist who spent years trying to unravel the secrets of the lost city of Heliopolis and its connections to the cult of sun worship. David takes Miriam to a place right in the center of what was the ancient city, where they can get a bird's eye view of the area. Whew, you okay? Why, right. Well, it's definitely worth the climb. We've got a, a wonderful view from up here. Um, we're looking over the town and temple area of Heliopolis. At first, the view from the minaret made Heliopolis seem even more mysterious. One of the greatest religious complexes of ancient Egypt, engulfed by urban sprawl and smothered with haze. But in the mist, there is a clue. An obelisk, 
built many years after the pyramids, but linked to the days of the pyramid builders, archaeologists have discovered that it marks the original site of the massive, long-lost sun temple devoted to the worship of the sun god, Re. After years of research, David Jeffries has put together a theory to explain why pyramid building sites were changed. Right, well, here's the obelisk. Um, in order to be comfortable, shall we just go over into the shade? I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Right, well, we're standing here in Sun City. We have to find a spot out of the sun, at least. Let's, uh, let's talk about it here. So if we've got a huge sun temple, <clears throat> and pharaohs who are building pyramids who are associated with the sun cult. What's the link? Well, it's interesting because the uh, whole question of the distribution of pyramids is, is not really well understood. Mm. They, they seem to skip about in, a, in an almost random way. Yeah. But one thing that is significant is that when the sun cult becomes important to the royal family, yeah. they move to Giza and then to Abarawash, and really that's when the connection with the sun cult becomes really clear. Right. Ra Jedef, who is the first one to have Ra, the sun, Ray, the sun, in his name, uh, and to call himself the son of the sun, he builds at Abu Rawash, which is the most clearly visible from where we are right. at, at Heliopolis. And then all the Giza pyramids are in a, 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 a direct line of sight with Heliopolis. Four and a half thousand years ago, the pharaohs would have been able to see the sun temple here at Heliopolis from their pyramids at Giza and Abu Ruash. David Jeffries believes that this view from tomb to temple was central to their religion. But not everywhere across the Nile had such a clear view. On the outskirts of Cairo stands an escarpment known as the Citadel Rock. This would have blocked the view of the sun temple at Heliopolis from many locations across the river. So perhaps the pharaohs that followed the sun cult were choosing the location of their tombs in order to ensure that they did have a view of Heliopolis. So it's all about lines of sight? It could well be, yes. For the followers of the sun cult, so the theory goes, seeing really was believing. As the pharaohs became more obsessed with worshipping the sun, they had to choose pyramid sites which would guarantee a good view of the center of Heliopolis. So the pharaoh Jedifre had built his pyramid at Abu Ruash to ensure he had a clear view of the temple of his favored god, Re. The next pharaoh, Kaifre, went back to Giza, as did his successor, Menkaure, but both chose sites where they still had a clear line of sight with Heliopolis. But the map also shows a weak link in this theory. I think that there's a problem with this lines of sight theory of David Jeffries. The next three pharaohs built their pyramids back near Saqqara at this place called Abu Sir, and they were still worshipping the sun god Re. But the problem is that the line of sight between Abu Sir and the Sun Temple at Heliopolis is blocked by the Citadel Rock. So, is David Jeffries wrong? Why did the pyramid builders at Abu Sir choose a site with no clear view of this vital temple? Miriam decides to invite him to Abu Sir to see if he had an explanation. But he suggests they actually meet just a few miles northeast of the pyramid site, among the ruins of another extraordinary building. And where we're standing is the key site. We're actually on top of the Sun Temple now. We only know of two of them as it is. We're standing on the, the actual tower of the, of the Sun Temple. So what's that structure down there for? Right, well, rather like a pyramid, the Sun Temple is surrounded by its own temple complex. And what we're looking at is, is really a unique uh, structure. We don't have anything quite like it from anywhere else in Egypt. And it's an altar of uh, what is sometimes called Egyptian alabaster or travertine, consisting of four segments that are actually a hieroglyphic sign. Uh, it's the, the offering table with a loaf of bread on it, the sign 
for hetep, which means to, to be satisfied or to, to, to make offerings. With its rows and of pens for hundreds of sacrificial animals and huge basins for collecting their blood, it was a very substantial and hence important structure. And most significantly of all, from its top, there is a clear line of sight to the pyramids at Abu Sir. But this wasn't the central sun temple at Heliopolis that previous pharaohs had gone to such lengths to be in sight of. So Miriam still needs an answer. Even when the kings are building at Abu Sir, um, the point really is this question of visibility from the center of the sun cult itself at Heliopolis. The Abu Sir pyramids are out of sight from Heliopolis. In building back near their capital of Memphis, these pharaohs had seemingly sacrificed that all-important view, a view previous rulers had gone to huge lengths to protect. Just to the south of Heliopolis, south, south of Cairo, you've got this promontory that sort of sticks out from the, the main cliff line uh, where the uh, Islamic citadel was built. We call it the, the Citadel Rock. And that interrupts the line of sight between Heliopolis and the Abu Sir pyramids. Even though the Abu Sir pyramids are sun kings, but their pyramids are back near close to Memphis and they cannot be seen from the center of the sun cult. But the, the sun temple can. The pyramids at Abu Sir would have had a view of this, their own sun temple, which itself then had a direct line of sight to Heliopolis. What David is suggesting was that this temple created a visual link a relay between the Abu Sir pyramids and Heliopolis. It is an ingenious solution to the pharaoh's problem of building near their physical capital of Memphis, but also maintaining their connection with their spiritual home at Heliopolis. A uniquely Egyptian answer to reconciling the physical problems of pyramid building with the spiritual demands of the gods. This was the truth behind the riddle of the pyramids. Egyptian kings chose their burial places with an eye to the gods, but also with concern for the massive logistical effort involved in building these legendary structures. Building a pyramid could be a lifetime's work for thousands of people, from stone cutters to priests. But in undertaking such colossal enterprises, everyone knew they had to balance the physical needs of the construction with the spiritual requirements of the pharaoh. Together, these, in the form of the pyramid, ensured Egypt would itself remain a wonder of the world. It's time for the Egypt detectives to compare notes and see whose theory is right. Well, I must admit, I did think that the whole pyramid building business was to do with geology and building blocks. But David has convinced me there's more to it. I had a feeling it wasn't as straightforward as your geological argument. Yeah, but don't forget that the first move to Giza was about limestone and space, and not sun cults. Well, fair enough. So we're both right. Yep. Chin chin. Mummies are among the most celebrated creations of ancient Egypt. Invented to preserve the dead for eternity, Many mysteries still surround them. Now Egyptologist Dominic Montserrat and archaeologist Miriam Cook investigate one of the most remarkable mummy puzzles of all. For more than 3,000 years, the ancient Egyptians mummified their dead and buried them in style. But they didn't just mummify people. They used their skill to do something very odd indeed. In a labyrinth of tunnels dug deep beneath the pyramids, there is a whole other world. It is stuffed full of animal mummies. Why on earth did the ancient Egyptians mummify so many animals?
Saqqara, near modern Cairo. This was the burial ground of the pharaohs. Over 4,500 years ago, the very first pyramids were built and kept safe deep inside with the mummies of kings. But beneath these pyramids was another far more mysterious world. A dark labyrinth of tunnels and huge elaborately decorated sarcophagi. This was the last resting place not of kings, but of bulls, all mummified. Elsewhere beneath Saqqara, another astonishing discovery was made. Yet more tunnels containing thousands of clay jars. Inside were mummified animals, including hawks, ibises, and baboons. Here lies a mystery, a secret world of mummified animals, literally millions of them. But why? On the Nile, heading towards Cairo, Egypt detectives Dominic Montserrat and archaeologist Miriam Cook discuss the puzzle and where to start. I wonder why they're doing it. I mean, mummifying humans implies some sort of desire to preserve them for eternity so that they can be reborn, but, but animals? Yeah, it doesn't make sense for animals, unless they were considered as important as humans. Yeah. Mummification of humans was essential to Egyptian religion. After death, the soul depended on the preservation of its physical body for all its needs. The Egyptians developed highly sophisticated techniques, using oils and resins, to preserve the appearance of the dead person. The ancient Egyptians were mummifying humans and animals. The question was, were they treated in the same way after death? The Egypt detectives decided to follow different leads. Dominic headed off to see one of the biggest collections of animal mummies in the world, at the Cairo Museum. He arranged to meet a leading expert on animal mummification, Dr. Salima Ikram. So Salima, why does one mummify anything? Well, the ancient Egyptians believed that by mummifying something, it would last for eternity, so it could live forever, which is why they mummified. Right, but that makes the whole animal mummy question more complicated, doesn't it? Because there's such an array of animals here. Yeah, in fact, this is a wonderful cobra. Uh -huh little uh, crocodiles, crocodile eggs. That one actually has a small crocodile in it, right. sort of curled up. Um, and we've got this fabulous eagle, wow. which is gilded, and um, another falcon as well. And what's over here? Over here we've got tons more. We've got a dog and mm -hmm. cat. And uh, were any of these pets? No, but we in fact do have a pet over here. Come wow. and see. They still have hunting dogs like this in Egypt with curly tails. And look, he was found with this wonderful baboon. Oh. He was found with his arms folded like this, just looking woefully up at the dogs. It's really <laughs> sweet. And what are these? These are really unusual. These are food mummies. The ancient Egyptians believed that if you wanted something, you could take it with you. So, for example, if you liked your Sunday roast, you could have order a gross dozen and have them mummified, wrapped up, and then put in your tomb so you could enjoy them for eternity. So, pets, Sunday joints, what's the common denominator? The majority of animal mummies that we have were like this crocodile. It was sacred. For the ancient Egyptians, Crocodiles were sacred because they were the earthly form of a god, and they weren't the only animals worshipped in ancient Egypt. At one of the most important temples in Egypt, there was evidence of the significance of animals in Egyptian society and religion, and it was etched all over the walls. Animals are everywhere in Egyptian culture. On this temple wall, I can see a row of baboons here. There's two snakes above them. And over there is a lioness. There's a vulture. These are just a few members of this sacred zoo. It's these animal gods that make Egyptian culture so unique. Some animals were almost like pharaohs. This is the hawk god Horus. He's always associated with the pharaohs. This is because hawks appear to fly so close to the sun, and pharaohs are the sons of Re, the sons of the sun. This statue of Horus shows him as a pharaoh as well as a hawk. And that's his crown. Mm -hmm. 
Some animals were linked to pharaohs and were worshipped as gods. But how were they treated in death? Pharaohs were mummified with great care. Could the same be said of sacred animals? To find out, Dominic and Miriam turned to Dr. Stephen Buckley, based in Britain. He has spent years analyzing the chemicals and materials used in the complex Egyptian process of mummification. Stephen has been unwrapping animal mummies and using state-of-the-art chemical analysis to work out how they were mummified, then comparing this process to the one used on human mummies. The detectives knew that Stephen had been working on mummified hawks, the animal used to represent the god Horus. I'll see if I can get him online. It's gonna work. I don't know, we can only try. His work turned out to confirm what they suspected. Here, you're seeing um, plant oils and uh, beeswax being mixed together, which is also what we see in uh, many of the elite human mummies at this time. The care and attention taken with this hawk suggests that um, they were looking at this as being a representation of the particular deity of uh, Horus. So the evidence showed that after death, the ancient Egyptians did use the same highly sophisticated techniques to mummify sacred animals like hawks as they did humans. And according to Egypt's leading expert, Dr. Zahi Hawaz, the ancient Egyptians saw their gods within animals. You know, you have to understand uh, the religion of ancient Egypt. And uh, the religion of ancient Egypt that the Egyptian uh, looked at animal as sacred and divine, because animals did play an important part in the life of the ancient Egyptian. When the Egyptian mummify a cow and worship a cow, it did not mean that the Egyptian worshipped the cow. They worshipped what is in the cow. The Egyptian looked at what is in the animal to worship the brilliance and the divine. The sacred brilliance of animals seemed to burn brightest near the pyramids of the pharaohs at Saqqara. Here, the Egyptians dug a vast network of tunnels which burrow deep into the ground and date back to about 1400 BC. The Serapeum is a remarkable piece of engineering and it was devoted to a single god, a god who took the form of an animal, the Apis bull. And Dr. Salima Ikram took Dominic straight into their world. This is the most extraordinary place. It's pretty fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. It's a long, dark tunnels. Do you know there are about three kilometers of tunnels here? No idea at all. During its life, the Apis bull was one of the most pampered living creatures in Egypt. After a ceremonial selection process, the chosen bull was provided with its own temple and even servants and a harem of cows. When the Apis bull died, its body was treated with great reverence. And there were these side chapels off. Yeah, there are lots and lots of side chapels that go all the way around, which are places where the bulls are buried. At the climax of its funeral, the body of the bull was carried through these corridors and placed inside one of the most impressive funeral monuments in Egypt. Here it is. Good heavens. That is colossal. It's really huge. Would you mind lighting me down, please? Of course not. This is a sarcophagus for one of the sacred Apis bulls. Why spend all this time, money, and engineering expertise on a bull? During their lifetime, they would be oracles, they would be the god incarnate. People could actually approach them and pray to them and ask them questions, and the god would respond. And it was one of the few times that any normal Egyptian could have an interaction with a divinity. How did it end up in this enormous stone box? Well, after they died, they were mummified because they were the same kind of things, gods on earth. So they would have been eviscerated with all their internal organs removed. They would have then been dried with natron. And after that, they would have been wrapped up with bandages. 
And then after that, they'd be brought down through this corridor with great pomp and circumstance and celebrations and weeping and wailing at the same time. And then finally put inside these boxes, these sarcophagi, where they were supposed to rest for eternity. The archaeological evidence seemed to suggest that because sacred animals like the Apis bull were the living forms of gods, the ancient Egyptians may have treated them with the same reverence as they did their pharaohs. Just like royalty, the sacred animals needed to be mummified to guarantee a successful afterlife. But at the other animal burial ground beneath Saqqara, archaeologists have recently made a count of all the animal mummies buried there, and there are literally millions of them. The Egypt detectives were sure that such a vast number of mummified animals could not all be as sacred as hawks and apis bulls. The investigation was about to take a surprising turn and would reveal an unexpected link to the decline and fall of ancient Egypt itself. Archaeologist Miriam Cook and Egyptologist Dominic Montserrat are on a quest to find out why the Egyptians mummified animals in their millions. Scientific analysis has shown that some of these, like Apis bulls, were sacred and received the same mummification treatment after death as humans. But the Egypt detectives were sure that there was another reason behind the floor-to-ceiling piles of animal mummies at the Saqqara burial ground. The animal necropolis was first discovered in the 1920s. It is a maze of winding tunnels. But unlike the burial chamber of the Apis bull, devoted to a single sacred animal, the necropolis has many different sorts of mummified animals stacked up to the ceiling. Of the thousands of burial places left by the ancient Egyptians, the catacombs here at Saqqara must be the strangest. For buried down here are more than two and a half million animals, every one of them mummified. And this is just one of them. There are many different species of animal buried down here, including ibis, hawks and baboons. This zoo was very different from the Serapeum's cult of the single apis bull. To see how these compared to the mummies of Apis bulls, the Egypt detectives asked mummification expert Dr. Stephen Buckley to carry out some tests on other animal mummies. I wonder what Stephen managed to find out for us. Well, I've got him online here. Hang on a second. You're good at this. The Egypt detectives were in for a big surprise. Although it's very clear that some of these mummies were treated with a great deal of care and reverence and expensive materials, um, many others were fairly cheap and cheerful. Uh, and in fact, some put together by using sticks and other bits of material. This evidence suggested that many mummies were poorly produced. Stephen had even discovered fakes, animal mummies with nothing inside. This new evidence of mass production and fakes painted a very different picture from the carefully mummified sacred animals, like apis bulls and hawks. It does seem like it's a sudden craze. Miriam and Dominic knew that the apis bulls' burial chambers were built around 1400 BC. They contacted Stephen to find out if the sacred animals and fakes were made at different periods in time. If we focus on the wrappings, these can be a, a useful way of determining which period in Egyptian history they came from. The more elaborate wrappings came in relatively late, 300 BC and onwards, uh, during the Ptolemaic and particularly the Roman period, up to about 400 AD, where we really saw a, a big explosion in these numbers at this time. Hmm, sounds like a bit of a sudden craze. Yeah, rather than a long-term accumulation. Stephen's work showed that there had been an explosion of animal mummification after 300 BC, a time when ancient Egypt was under foreign rule. The Egypt detectives headed to Alexandria, then Egypt's capital, to find out what was happening at the time. So the 
key is those few hundred years, and we need to find out what was happening in Egypt at that time. Well, at that time, Egypt is changing beyond all recognition. We're here in Alexandria, the city built by Alexander the Great. He conquered Egypt and added it to his world empire. Then his successors ruled it for the best part of three centuries. And during that time, the culture changed. Egypt had been conquered before and recovered, but the arrival of Alexander the Great changed this civilization forever. Alexander himself stayed for a very short time in Egypt, but he left behind a new ruling family, the Ptolemies, who took the place of the Egyptian pharaohs and ruled Egypt for more than 300 years. For the Egyptians, the new foreign rulers brought prosperity, and they had a fondness for Egyptian culture. Could this have anything to do with the animal mummies? Well, the animal mummies are all from temples, aren't they? So I think we need to find out exactly what's happening in the Egyptian temples under these foreign rulers. To find out if there was a connection between foreign conquest and the new craze for animal mummification, the detectives went to one of Egypt's biggest temples, at Edfu. This immense temple, dedicated to Horus, the hawk god, was built by the new rulers of Egypt, who are shown as pharaohs on the massive temple walls. Before Alexander the Great and his heirs, Egyptian temples were accessible only to their priests and the Egyptian elite. In earlier Egyptian times, temples would have been inaccessible to ordinary people like us. We'd have been stopped here at the great enclosure walls that ring the temple. So elite spaces, really? Oh yes, absolutely. And ordinary people would have polluted them just by going inside. But Edfu was not exclusive to the elite. Its doors were also open to the middle classes. But how did this link to the animal mummification craze? And the evidence lies in the architecture. Come and have a look at this. You'd never get a structure like this in an earlier Egyptian temple, right inside the enclosure walls. It's a complete innovation. Go on. Well, we know that people could hire the rooms inside structures like this for private celebrations, like weddings and comings of age. So it's as though the great temples are being integrated into the private religious lives of individuals. And what evidence do we have for this? Oh, lots of documentation. In some cases, the actual wedding invitations. So really big changes are happening. Mm. The boundaries are being broken down between the public and the private spaces, and people are being allowed in. Yeah, that's right. What we need to do now, of course, is relate it back to the animal mummies. Temples like the one at Edfu became popular places under Egypt's new rulers. This was a radical change. Common people were allowed inside certain temple walls. Under foreign rule, many Egyptian traditions had been lost, but one of the main surviving legacies of their great culture was their religion. The Egypt detectives thought it was likely that there was a link between this, the new temple culture, and animal mummification. Miriam and Dominic headed north again to piece together the evidence. Dominic knew that temples kept records and that these might hold the solution to the mystery. And temple records from Saqqara have survived. I'm looking at a drawer full of Egyptian temple records and they're written on pieces of broken pot, which was actually a very common way of archive keeping at that time. And from what I'm seeing here, I'm getting an amazingly detailed picture of life in an Egyptian temple in all its facets, ritual, economic, social. The temple records held the final piece of the puzzle. When people began visiting the new temples in the new Egypt, they brought gifts for the god. These were called votive offerings, and most of them took the form of sacred mummified animals. These were what made Egyptian religion so exceptional. Over time, as the changes to Egyptian society gathered pace under the new rulers, more and more of these offerings were brought, so more and more mummies had to be made. The temples became mummy factories, supplying votive animal mummies for the right price. Embalmers and potters would have been in high demand, 
There were even farms breeding animals just for mummification. So what is going on? It's a combination of religion, culture and money. Are you saying that the priests are making money out of the animal mummies? Well, not exactly. Remember what's happening at this time. The Egyptians are coming more and more to the temples and they want to show their piety and devotion to the gods by leaving a votive offering, an animal mummy. The priests sense a money-making opportunity and so they start producing animal mummies to sell to the public. Well, that would explain the mass production and the presence of those fakes that Stephen was talking about. Exactly. Religion, culture and money all come together. Result? Two and a half million animal mummies. Egypt had been conquered, but it had hung on to a vital aspect of its culture by offering millions of animal mummies to the gods. But without any real power to sustain it, this extraordinary civilization began to fade. Then, it finally disappeared beneath the sands. <laughs> 